Okay, it's about 10 o'clock. Thanks again for joining. Um, excited, we've done a couple uh, educational classes or sessions on uh, planting design, planting selection, as well as um, kind of how it relates to beekeeping and promoting our pollinators. So today we were just gonna talk a little bit about uh, pollinators, some plant choices that you can use in the garden and getting started with beekeeping, specifically how to start uh, honeybee colonies or a honeybee hive or two for your backyard. So excited to uh, partake in this and we've altered, I've kind of changed things a little bit from a previous lecture that I gave. So if you've seen some of these slides, bear with me made a few changes, but um, just kind of some of the fun basic things that you can consider uh, when planting your garden, garden or chalets helping plant your garden or design the garden and um, some fun with beekeeping and how it relates the plants and how they would relate to uh, pollination and honeybees. Looks like we have about 12 participants. Um, actually that's climbed uh, increase since I looked at that last. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thanks again. I'm gonna to try to toggle back and forth here a little bit, so bear with me, but there's a cool video that um, talks a little bit about habit, um, habitat, and I do think it kind of relates to thinking outside the box and some of the fun things that you can do to increase habitat for not only honeybees, but other uh, beneficial pollinators, native bees, uh, bumblebees we see quite a few of, and the weather in June has been pretty good. So pollinators have been uh, pretty fortunate and we've been fortunate with the June weather. We obviously had a lot of rain uh, prior to June um, but I wanted to see if I could actually pull up this quick little video. It's only a couple minutes uh, before I get started on the presentation. Sorry, technical difficulties, bear with me. <laughs> Okay, so that's not working. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, some of the benefits of beekeeping, uh, we talked a, a little bit about like the biology with, with basic beekeeping. Um, I was hoping to get this video up, but I am not able to get the video up. Cool, there we go. Yeah, and um, some of the topics could kind of relate to a few of the things from this quick video um, when we're done to chat about. Every year in late January and early February, the world's largest pollination migration takes place as two million hives of honeybees are moved to California to pollinate one million acres of almond trees, which helps generate an $11 billion industry and over 80% of the world's almonds. The best way to describe uh, bees, honeybees, and almonds and the way they interact with each other is a two very large industries that need the world's largest pollination migration to happen. The biggest pollination event in the world is California almonds, and that happens very early um, in the year. So in January and February, those beekeepers need to have the bees placed in the almonds where they need two million colonies to pollinate all of those almond orchards. Project APSM's program, Seeds for Bees, works with almond growers and landowners in California to plant forage crops in and around almonds, which supports the health of these pollinating honeybees, provides benefits to almond growers, and promotes good stewardship of the land. Seeds for Bees is a program that is critical to the almond grower and the beekeeper because it is providing forage, which is a food for bees. It's doing this uh, by planting cover crops in or around the orchards, and it provides food for bees when they need it the most, when they're at their hungriest. Seeds for bees seed mixes include the Pam mustard mix, Pam clover mix, and a vetch option. The mustard varieties, along with giving the bees some early uh, nutrition, it also gets the bees excited so that when the, the almonds do bloom, they're ready to attack those blossoms basically and get after pollinating them. The other benefit of the mustard mix, there's a radish blend in there that helped 
penetrate the soil. We have pretty heavy soils here in Arbuckle, and so we get a lot of soil cracking as the summer goes on and it dries out. And so this is helping break up that soil and adding organic matter deep into the soil. Each mix is designed to offer specific benefits to honeybees and growers based on the grower's needs. The seeds and technical assistance that Seeds for Bees provides gives honeybees the critical nutrition they need in order to thrive leading up to and following the almond bloom. We have an orchard over by Woodland and they planted a Seeds for Bees mix prior to the almond bloom. When our bees arrived, blossoms were up and the bees had something to forage on before the bloom began. It was like jump starting the hive prior to the almond bloom. Well, this was this is smart farming. The plants and seeds for bees seed mixtures work to increase organic matter, prevent erosion, increase water infiltration, increase nitrogen, suppress weeds, decompose mummy nuts, and attract beneficial insects, providing additional benefits to growers. There are often questions about seeds for bees cover crops competing with the almond bloom, but studies have shown that this is not the case. Just visually as a grower walking through the orchard during bloom time, um, I see a lot of bee activity throughout the cover crop and in the trees. Another concern of growers is frost in the orchards during bloom, which can easily be managed with good practices, mowing when necessary. Seeds for Bees cover crops support a healthy environment by providing habitat for other beneficial insects and pollinators, reducing pesticide use and runoff, retaining water, and improving soil health. We definitely saw a difference in where we had cover crops versus where we did not during the wet spring. And where we actually had cover crop, we were losing less soil because of the roots and holding on to that soil. Project APSM has designed Seeds for Bees to be a simple process by giving almond producers an easy way to practice better sustainability and stewardship of the land. Compared to other programs, it is much easier. With APSM, it was a simple phone call and within a few weeks, we had the seed. A lot of times with the different cost sharing opportunities, growers get bogged down by cropping history and digging for old files about finances and different personal information. We don't ask for any of that. And you have to be a, a grower in California of almonds that really wants to help out their soil and bees. We believe that putting forage back in the agricultural landscape is an important part of sustainability. And Seeds for Bees is a great way to integrate these benefits into almond growing practices. Learn how you can participate and support Seeds for Bees by visiting projectapsm.org. Cool. So, yeah, I thought that was just a, a fun video that can tie into some of the planting discussions. Um, I'm assuming we probably have a good amount of gardeners uh, in the webinar here today. I hope so. We might even have some beekeepers in the webinar. So I'm going to post my email at the end. Um, it's actually adams at chaletnursery.com. If there's any questions, I would welcome, I would love any uh, feedback or comments or questions as we may not get to all of the, the questions. So um, if you could, by all means, please email me if there's any questions. We might be able to pull up a chat box at the end uh, with any comments that you can kind of type in towards the end. So I should have started with my background um, is landscape design and uh, maintenance management within the Chalet Landscape Division. Uh, my background is studying landscape architecture from the U of I. Um, and that's currently what I do here with Chalet is design and maintenance management. So a little bit of both. And that's what I enjoy doing is thinking about plant considerations um, and the fun that you can have with the beauty of design, the aesthetics, but also bringing in plants for benefits. So feeding, you know, our pollinators and nectar sources, you know, what plants produce nectar versus what plants actually have a higher concentration of pollen. Uh, you can get into a lot of detail. There's a really good book actually that breaks down many plants in our area and in and around the country um, about specific plants and the amount of nectar that they have versus the pollen. Um, so it's fun for me to look at, you know, perennials versus shrubs versus trees. You know, the three types of plants that we the plant the most of, herbaceous perennials, uh, woody shrubs, and then mature trees that can turn into beautiful shade trees and the flowers that produced. So that's what the bees need are the flowers. They're attracted to the flowers uh, by color, scent, um, 
and, and texture, uh, the aroma and actually the, the scent of the flowers is one of the, the biggest attractants for, for bees. So those are some things that we're going to kind of touch upon in this uh, presentation. Uh, with my background here, I've got into beekeeping. Um, a good friend of mine, Charlie, who I studied with at, at U of I and actually grew up with in Freeport, Illinois. Um, he does honeybee research um, in, at UC Davis in California. So he knows a heck of a lot more about beekeeping than I do, but uh, he kind of got me into it. So it's been fun occasionally kind of bounce things off of him and learn from him. Um, some friends at the Lake County Beekeepers Association actually is, is one of the best resources. If anyone's thinking about getting into beekeeping, I would, I would definitely recommend looking into a county uh, beekeeping club or association. That's the best starting point. Um, you can network with so many different people, new beekeepers, people that have been doing it for years and years and make connections and learn about all things bees and, and the tie into gardening and planting. So that connection again is, is really fun for me. Um, I have a lot of good friends at the Lake County Beekeepers. Um, oh, if you're thinking about getting into beekeeping, that would be great. Um, and then making, you know, connections I would strongly recommend to, to people that you either know. Um, it's a good place to actually find equipment. So equipment is one thing that um, you really want to consider is, you know, new, new equipment or also being careful with um, if there's older equipment, um, knowing where you, where you would be purchasing or, or borrowing uh, wood, woodenware for the, the beekeeping boxes itself to do, get to get into backyard beekeeping. So kind of talking through, um, you know, what bees need, I mentioned like nectar and pollen. So the nectar is the carbohydrate and the pollen is the protein that they bring back uh, for the bees uh, to keep the hive and the brood healthy. So the pollen, and there's many different types of pollen sources, um, is the brood and kind of the vitamins and the minerals for the, the baby bees. So usually in a, a beehive box, you've got about 10 frames, kind of wall to wall brood and the bees know they're smart enough and they know where to, you know, put the pollen and put the nectar and they move it around. So within a beehive, there's a lot of different things going on at the same time. And learning the basics and the, you know, basic biology of beekeeping is, is fun. It's not in-depth uh, biology, but it's kind of getting to know, you know, what the worker bees do and then how it revolves around the queen bee. So everything does revolve around the queen bee in a beehive, uh, keeping her healthy, uh, with proper nourishment um, and then we actually we're going to kind of go into a little bit of that but yeah getting started with beekeeping and that local source of you know connections that you can make um, buying bees is usually where most people will start the goal that that a lot of people have is to try to get your bees through the winter time so having you know your honeybees get through the winter time is the best thing you can do and there's a lot of different things and stresses that can take place with with bees such as varroa mites. So that's probably the top thing that researchers are trying to wrap their head around um, is battling the parasitic varroa mite, uh, which can weaken the, the overall health of the beehive. Um, so managing that and making the right decisions on how you want to address things such as varroa mites and, and trying to get your bees through the winter is one of my main goals. Um, coming up with goals is, is a really good idea. So if you're thinking about having, you know, a backyard hive or two beehives or, or more, you know, what are you want, what do you want to do it for? Is it for honey? Is it for simply the fauna of pollinators in the backyard or on your property? Um, so there's a number of different things that you'd want to think about kind of before you get started. Um, each beehive their package that you would buy would, would come with a queen. So you'd have your own little queen that you release slowly, but there's, there's so many different pheromones within a bee colony um, that these bees acclimate, you know, before they get to you. Um, so there's some kind of buzzwords, unintended, um, but things that you might hear about or read about um, that take place during foraging and also within a beehive. There's royal jelly, which actually gets fed and that's what I find is fascinating is that there's so many different things that the bees need 
and they know how to um, keep a hive healthy, keep a queen healthy. So uh, things like bee bread and, and honey and nectar and propolis. Propolis is actually a resin that bees know to forage for. Um, and it has different roles throughout the season. So during the season, it gets kind of hot and sticky. It can be foraged on like cottonwoods, um, resins from conifer trees, but the bees will bring that back um, and actually kind of solidify the hive. And, and in the wintertime, it kind of seals up and glues the hive. So it's not just nectar and pollen. There are other things that bees will forage for. Um, so that's just some of like the basic terminology without going into too much detail. But as uh, many people may know, you know, you've got the queen and then the drones are actually the males. Um, and then the majority of the, the beehive is gonna be worker bees, you know, female worker bees is the, the majority of the population in a beehive. There may be, you know, maybe a thousand to 2000 drones throughout the season. Um, if, a, if a beehive is not healthy or if it's stressed, Honeybees will actually kick out some of the drones and in the, at the end of the season, they will push out some of the male drones. So they have these efficiencies and they know how to um, you know, keep, a, keep a hive healthy. The drones are strictly to mate early in the season and they're not good foraging. That's the female worker bee that's going to do the majority of the tasks in a beehive. The age of the, the worker bee uh, dictates a lot, older bees, uh, from research will show that older bees many times will be guard bees at the entrance of a beehive. Um, nurse bees many times are the younger bees. And sometimes you can see the different colors, like a young bee might be lighter in color. So you can learn these different things by having fun and studying honeybees throughout the season based on the age. So an egg will be laid, I think it's three to four days, and then it will go through complete metamorphosis. Um, into different stages to become an adult. I think it's 21 days before a, from an egg laying to when an adult hatches from a uh, capped brood. And it's, I think it's so, it's unique. Honeybees can be studied. They can be, um, you know, worked for lack of a better term, but studied. And that's what's so cool about honeybees specifically. We do need our native bees. We need all of our friendly pollinators being pollinator weak. Um, you'll read about a lot more than just the honeybee, specifically, you know, native bees and, and things we can do to promote not just honeybees, but what I love about honeybees is you can study them and it's tangible and you can see how they're functioning as a, a social colony versus like a solitary. A lot of some native insects can be solitary ground dwellers and it's harder to study them. Um, so as the adult bees kind of emerge, you know, in a, in a given season, you might have up to 60, maybe 70,000 bees in a healthy hive. You think of a beehive that's stacked and you want to give bees space. In this picture here, you can actually see the queen here. This is a photo I took a few years ago, but you can see the larger abdomen of this queen bee with her head uh, down into one of the hexagonal cells of nectar. So constant evolving, constant, you know, eating. Bees will move food around the hive. Um, the bees know how to cap the, bit, the brood before it uh, emerges. And then without going into too much, uh, you know, detail about some of the other biology, just kind of things that I like to do and while beekeeping, um, you know, a lot of people for photography, a lot of Beekeepers that I know, they're strictly into it. Maybe it's a little bit for the honey, but they love to photograph bees. I think that's fun. I took this photo a few years ago with an iPhone, just bees coming in and out of the hive. Um, so again, some of the, the things that bees will forage for uh, throughout the season, like tasks that and timing that you would need for proper expectations of, you know, what is it gonna take to maybe start a beehive? Um, in spring and fall, we had a really rainy spring, obviously, and um, most beekeepers would, would provide like an artificial nectar. So sugar water or sugar syrup is usually fed to a bee colony in spring and then many times in fall when there's a lull or a dearth of, of nectar. So chalet, at Chalet, we've got beehives at our farm in Wisconsin, and it's been fun because we have a lot of plants that grow 
very close to where the beehives were located, uh, from herbaceous perennials to woody shrubs and trees that bloom periodically throughout the season. So you can kind of relate that to what's going on in your garden and think about maybe, you know, some of the plants we can talk about towards the end is, you know, what's blooming at certain times and what do the bees see or not see uh, when they're foraging. So like humans, a pretty flower is seen by us and it's seen by honeybees and other pollinators from many times like miles away for bees. Um, the, the scent, you know, sensory olfactory, olfactory I think is um, aroma and smelling, but the vision and the eyesight and what bees see is incredible from a long distance away. So beautiful, bigger flowers, you know, catalpa trees are in bloom right now and bees can see those from a long distance. Um, kind of the bullseye effect of, of where the, the nectar and the nectary, um, nectaries are, like a cone flower, looks kind of like a bullseye. Plants like that will typically be foraged on more efficiently and more productively. I'm sure many people have seen these bees in their garden in June. Uh, cone flower kind of as we get into July. So some plant recommendations we were, I was going to kind of talk about a little bit in regards to like uh, the, the recent blog that I wrote, but those are simply just five or six of my favorite plants. So this would be a quick photo of mid season, probably about July and maybe into August where you'd want to add space to your beehive. Certainly want to add space to provide the bees enough room to kind of grow. Um, swarming is mother nature's version of bees want to reproduce. So bees tendency, tendencies are to swarm, unfortunately, but that's mother nature working and, and bees reproducing. So if you can manage that to the best of our abilities, and many beekeepers know that it can be very challenging to um, reduce the tendencies of swarms, but we try to do our best by doing things like adding space and adding boxes to a beehive. When bees swarm, about half the colony leaves with the old queen and they're trying to find a new home. There were some um, screenshots. I did not take this photo here, but um, it's just really fun and fascinating to kind of see how the bees work. You know, looking at the picture of the bees proboscis, their tongue parts, the mouth part, um, just incredibly efficient and how the bees store the pollen on the, the back quarters of the bee, the hind legs and the pollen sac. They kind of rake pollen as they forage off of their body to a pollen sac on the back um, side of the legs of the bees. So those would be your worker bees, your female worker bees that work hard throughout the entire season. So with June being so nice and the weather being phenomenal, wet spring, but a really good June, um, a lot of beekeepers are enjoying the amount of production that uh, that bees are having and, and more bees watching them in their garden. In the winter time, there's tasks, you know, maintenance tasks that we do, but every beekeeper has a different um, method of how they want to keep bees all around. Some people wrap their beehives in the winter, some people do not. Um, if you have a strong population going into late fall and winter of the numbers of bees, personally, I think that's going to dictate a lot and then your varroa might count how many mites you have or don't have in your colony is going to dictate the success rate of getting your bees through the winter and if you can get your bees through the winter um we've given a couple presentations and i think that was a photo of a, a friend's a bee yard um so bee yards or apiaries can look like a number of different things quantity of bees but um if you can get your bees through the winter they're going to be well ahead of, of a new package of bees from a foraging standpoint and collecting nectar. You know, you're gonna have early spring when the bulbs bloom. Um, you're gonna be well ahead of the game versus having a package, a new package of bees. So some of our hives that made it through the winter this past winter, uh, two of them are doing really well, knock on wood, um, and they're ahead of the game. So they're growing in population and in numbers as the queen is, is viable and doing really well. This is at the chalet farm a couple years back. We've painted, had fun painting beehives and, you know, I think there's, there's research that shows that like flowers, bees will be attracted to colors. 
Um, but to be honest, you know, a white uh, bee box is going to be just as fine, uh, just as good. But it is kind of fun painting the bees, the bee boxes, different colors and, and placing them in your garden as more of an um, artistic, um, you know, if you've got a location in a the back corner of your property. Windbreak is really good. This is a friend and a customer in um, the Deerfield area that manages kind of some of his bees. He, he manages them himself. So it's been really fun to, to work with friends and some, some clients of our landscape department where we kind of, you know, consider different plants within the garden, but to get people excited about beekeeping is, uh, is certainly a passion of mine and kind of educating people that it is fun you want to obviously talk to your near neighbors, uh, know what the municipality does or doesn't allow, but really just educating um, people on the benefits of, of beekeeping and having our bees. Um, this is a, a friend and a, a client in the Highland Park area who has uh, two or three beehives and it's just been a lot of fun to kind of see the bees in the garden and then designing it. So I've spent some time designing certain gardens um, where you can kind of integrate a couple beehives here and there. I think it's nice to start with two beehives if you're interested in getting into it. If you do lose one of the hives for whatever reason or there's a swarm, it's kind of nice to have a second beehive um, to study and to relate. There's things you can do by splitting and dividing hives and propagating bees. So it's fun to sometimes start with more than one beehive, but it's also easy to grow and gain a lot of equipment and have a lot of equipment on hand. So, you know, two to three beehives is, is really nice to have, um, you know, two to four beehives to, to study and, and watch in the garden. Another friend and client here, not too far away from the chalet um, with a beautiful garden and, you know, enjoying the bees on the property and watching them. Weather can dictate a lot. The bees have a kind of internal barometer that they can sense when weather is changing. Like today, um, overcast conditions or the, the rain comes in quick. You can literally watch these bees do magnificent things. Back to the hive, bearding on the hive, which is the, you know, looks like the onset of a swarm, but it's not a swarm. Bees are just kind of cooling off on a hot day before the rain and getting back to the hive uh, before a rain event. So this was fun to watch um, a couple of years ago. The rain came in fast at our farm in, in Wisconsin and it, within a matter of two minutes, uh, these bees all came back to their hive and it was unbelievable how quickly they made it back into the bee boxes and back into their home to beat the rain. But it was also a really hot day. So sometimes they'll do that where they'll be uh, beard on the outside of the hive, but it's strictly to, to cool themselves. You know, having storage is one thing I would highly recommend is if you're thinking about getting into beekeeping is having you know, enough space for your boxes. Um, and then if, you know, you've got honey going through winter, moths, um, wax moths can actually become an issue if you've got a lot of extra equipment. Um, you want to be careful with where you're putting beehives and then be careful for some insects that can come in and actually lay their eggs like wax moths in the wax frames. So some considerations um, when thinking about equipment and getting into bee, beekeeping is you'll want to have a spot for some backup equipment for extra boxes and frames. So the, the really fun part is again the planting, you know, planting considerations whether it's herbaceous plants um, and or some of the woodies. With the, the blog, there were just a few fun plants that I had chose to kind of highlight. Um, and some maybe, maybe underutilized plants, some of these plants many people know and, and maybe have in their garden and have known them for years, but like the bottle brush buckeye is a particular plant that you need a lot of width for. Um, it's a shrub that's going to really fill out over time. It can take some shade, but it does need sunlight and um, this magnificent blooms of kind of white long panicles. If you have the width and if you have the space for bottle brush buckeye, it's a really fun plant. It does have some fall color, 
uh, if there's enough sunlight. Um, you know, and again, research will show that like honeybees see certain colors and can, can pick up on ultraviolet light. So the purples and the blues and the whites are very attractive to honeybees and other native pollinators. Um, I think it's really interesting that research shows, you know, what a bee sees. How do we know exactly what a honeybee sees, but the ultraviolet light is, um, stands out specifically to honeybees. So having those those nectar guides, like the bullseye, and then the different colors of the florets and the shape of the flower um, is attractive. You know, a lot of research shows like you can actually study like the departure and the arrival of honeybees by fixing and changing the environment. So that's how you can kind of determine, scientists have determined, you know, what plants are, are the best for, for, for foraging. Um, you can actually collect pollen samples as bees kind of come back into their, their hives. And that's based on the type of plant uh, throughout the season. Some plants, like in spring, Scylla, Siberian Syl, uh, Scylla, the purple little tiny purple flowers have a purple pollen, which is fun to see. The first time I saw that come back into a beehive, I couldn't figure out where the purple pollen was coming from. Um, so every plant is so different in its own ways, in many ways. Um, the button bush, button bush shrub, Cephalanthus, is a really fun plant. It's native. It's been around for a long time, but in the industry, in the trade, I start to see more, you know, people, designers using this. It can tolerate some wet areas, some damp areas, and the, the white kind of ping pong looking flower is very attractive to honeybees. Um, this plant will get pretty large as well. It has the potential to get large, but button bush I think is a great alternative, you know, to an Annabelle hydrangea. Um, wet areas can obviously be challenging. I think, you know, wet areas and shady areas is probably one of the worst combos for trying to design and consider, you know, plant options. But, you know, plants like button bush or clethra, those are some viable plant options for you know, medium-sized shrubs that are really good pollinating plants. Uh, but that can be a challenge because, as we know, wet sites, all plants need oxygen to kind of, um, and photosynthesis, the sunlight to, to properly photosynthesize. So incredibly wet feet is not good for any plant. There are willows, you know, we talk about river birch and some of these plants, like button bush, that can tolerate some of these conditions, which, which is really good. Um, Birch trees, river birch actually the, is a fairly decent pollen source. Um, some of the mature willows is a great, is a really great early pollen source for honeybees. Um, the clethra is, is, a, is a nice plant. If it's sited well, it has that compact, compact form to it. Um, there are many different attributes of some of these other plants, not only the, the flower, but the fall color. Um, it's just thinking about siting. So considering how you're siting some of these plants is, is good before you um, make a move on planting some of these. Cardinal flowers, I wrote a little bit about herbaceous perennials. Um, the cardinal flower is a native. It kind of stands up, you know, two to three feet high with a red flower um, with a kind of a terminal spike uh, with a, just a brilliant red kind of flaming um, almost spire look to it. So cardinal flower is, has been used for years, but I do like to incorporate that into some of the designs um, and siting in some of the wet areas. Can take a little bit of shade. Oops. And then some of these, you know, other natives and non-natives, it depends on what your goals are for your garden as to, you know, we talk about goldenrod and aster late in the season as a food source. Goldenrod is a phenomenal nectar source. Cool nights and warm days, goldenrod will produce just an abundant amount of nectar. Um, many goldenrod plants can be hard to control. They can be pretty invasive. So again, figuring out what your goals are, uh, what the space is that you have in your garden. Um, the milkweeds, you know, not only just honeybees, but butterflies and hummingbirds. With National Pollinator Week, it's fun to kind of 
you know, look at not only the honeybees, but some of the hummingbirds and like the sphinx moth. And there's some really awesome insects that will forage on different plants and based on the flower and the ease of getting in and out of flower, you know, the florets, hummingbirds are very efficient with getting into more of like the tubular flowers. Um, bumblebees have specific plants that they can forage on, you know, better and more efficiently than some of the honeybees. Hypericum, St. John's wort, I think I've got here. Um, great plant, I think somewhat underutilized, but it's a slow grower, but it's a really cool plant. I mean, there's not a lot of plants that have a flower like this, I think, as a, you know, a pollen source, just chock full of pollen. So St. John's wort uh, used in the medical industry, but beautiful flowers. They can, it can take somewhat wet feet, damp areas, um, but as it slowly grows, it can fill out and it's been fun to watch these plants on many sites, especially with sites that have, you know, backyard beehives. And, and even if you don't, you know, it's a, a nice plant for that yellow color as a medium sized shrub. Some of the wild asters mentioned in fall, it's getting into like late season foraging for honeybees as bees try to build up their food stores going into fall and winter. The plants like aster and goldenrod are especially important because um, they'll store that food for the winter, which is what honeybees will, will need and thrive on to try to get through the winter or the food stores. So leaving your honeybees as much honey as you can is a, is a really good idea and not robbing your honeybees of all the honey is a wise uh, practice in beekeeping. As I mentioned, just the fun of watching honeybees. You've got Russian sage in the back, along the backdrop, and roses in the middle, and coneflower to the front, and catmint in the foreground. Pretty good, you know, really good plants. Roses, you'll see some foraging, but really like the coneflower, the seeds on the coneflower, echinacea. It's just a really efficient perennial for the pollinators to feed on because of the seeds and the length of the seed heads. So to watch them kind of perched up on a coneflower and a really high nectar source with echinacea. Same with catmint and calamint. We mentioned calamint in the blog. There's a number of different types of calamint. Um, I really like the white cloud calamint. It's a little bit, almost has like an iridescent color to it. And it stays a little bit fairly compact. And there's a number of different types of calamint as well as catmint in the nepeta family. Uh, but with calamint, um, there's a few. Montrose white is pretty popular in the trade right now. It has a pretty compact form to it. Uh, but I really like the white cloud um, calamint. And you'll see bees and other insects, just the plant just chock full of these pollinators uh, summer. So this would be going into like mid-summer bloom time. So successional bloom time, you've got your spring perennials, in your bulbs, and then you get into midsummer, which we're going to be approaching here soon with your cone flowers and your, your calamint. Catmint is in full bloom right now and has been for a while. You can see the honeybee kind of foraging and sticking her proboscis down in to collect nectar in this case. There's a number of, of really cool, fun resources for books. Um, hundreds and hundreds of books that you can find online and simple Google searches. But there's a book that I really like that actually calls out specific plants and talks about the pollen content. I'm gonna to try to remember the name of it. I think it's um, Garden Plants for Honeybees. And um, it's, a, it's a really great book. It talks about month by month plants and species of plants and talks about why they're beneficial uh, to honeybees and other pollinators. Um, but also talks about the pollen content versus the nectar content. So I find that a really fun book to, to read through and flip through. It's Garden Plants for Honeybees. Um, I'm gonna, it's, I think it's Peter Linder by chance. Um, Garden Plants for Honeybees, really fun book. Um, basic Beekeeping 101 is probably the best book to start with, just the basics, and the biology of beekeeping. Uh, Doug, Tal Doug Talamy has given presentations, I've had a chance to meet him, he's a really, he's got a really good outlook on native plants, 
not focusing so much on honeybees, but other pollinators and designing for gardens for, for beneficial insects. It looks like he's got bottle brush buckeye along the left side of his, um, one of his books that he wrote. Um, really good book. Talks about native shrubs and trees. Um, so again, if there's a lot of talking, uh, so thanks for bear bearing with me here, but if there's questions or any comments for Chalet or myself, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email is adams at chaletnursery.com. I'll try to get down to a comments, uh, comment screen here towards the end, I think with a few more minutes. But um, being National Pollinator Week, we thought this was a, kind of a good and fun opportunity to just talk about some of our beneficial insects. Nothing new is, there's really nothing new with, with beekeeping in general. It's been around for a long time. Um, but just highlighting the fun that you can have with it and promoting it is not so much of a fear, but finding out what you can do or can't do uh, within your municipality. And if you're okay to, you know, legally keep bees and if your neighbors are okay with it, it can sure be a lot of fun and ties directly into planting design and, you know, what plants can be beneficial. And that's, you know, successional bloom time throughout the season uh, can be really fun. I mentioned the Northern Catalpa is in full bloom right now. Um, I had a friend and client that just sent me a picture, beautiful picture of the Catalpa flowers, which I think they're next to none for almost like, the, like an orchid-like beautiful flower, just stunning. And hummingbirds love this, this, this plant. So the Catalpa, Northern Catalpa, Catalpa speciosa, I believe, is in full bloom right now. And um, it's, a, it's a great tree. I think it's a good tree. You'll see it as a parkway tree or planted in parks because it doesn't have such a um, formal habit. Um, it grows, some people say it grows fast, but I, I've seen it grow pretty slow at times depending upon your soil conditions. It likes acidic and I think more sandy soils. Uh, but sometimes it takes a few years to even get a bloom. So some trees are unique in the sense that they don't bloom right away. Tulip tree is, is the same, uh, but catalpa tree, you may not have a flower bloom on it for many years. Um, kind of like how oak trees will mast and set acorns some years and not other years, like many plants. Um, soil conditions, weather conditions can dictate that. Uh, but it's beautiful right now. We're having, we have rain today a little bit, which is needed, highly needed, um, much needed. But a lot of these flowers that are in bloom right now, the bees have been foraging on very efficiently. And the rain, the rain is needed to kind of actually push sugars with photosynthesis from the leaves. The sugars transfer into the flowers. So this rain is very good right now. And it's been a good nectar flow throughout all of June. Um, so nectar flow would be the amount of nectar that plants are producing for the honeybees to forage on and collect. And June was just phenomenal. Um, so we had so much rain in spring, but June was really, really good. And hopefully we have a beautiful um, and pleasant July. I'm going to try to dip down to uh, the comment section. Our computer died earlier. The battery that was provided for me on this computer literally died. So we had cut out for a few minutes there and I cannot get to the comment section. So again, if anyone could email me, that would be really good. Um, if you have any questions, here's the chat. And a lot of support here at Chalet, you know, stopping in or calling in. Um, in my world, in my own little bubble, um, as on the design and the maintenance side of things, um, we are, you know, we're busy with designs, but we love working through designs and looking at considerations like what plants to use. So if you're looking for support, by all means, you can contact the chalet. Um, this is a fun time of year. It's a really busy time of year, but we're, you know, we're getting caught up a little bit. This next week, we're gonna be, I think a day ahead with the holiday coming up, but with the rain, 
um, this is going to be a, a pretty busy week from design standpoint and a maintenance standpoint for chalet. I'm going to try to get back to one thing here. We had watched a video in the very beginning. Um, I had the opportunity to go to an American Beef Federation conference in Schaumburg this winter in January. And um, there's so many really good organizations, many non-for-profit, but APIS, uh, Project APIS, I, I think is really, is really cool. They had someone talking about all the things that they've done for research for honeybees specifically. And when you think about um, crop pollination and almonds, how much we heavily rely on our honeybees. It's, it's obviously a proven fact that we, we have to have our honeybees for much of the fruits and nuts and vegetable pollination throughout the whole country. So at this conference, it was fascinating because there were people talking about all sorts of different things in regards to honeybees and research and beekeeping tactics um, and what beekeepers are, are seeing. And so it's everything from the local hobbyist beekeeper up to some of the top scientists um, with bee research. And Project APIS I thought was is fascinating. And they talked about a little bit about almonds, but um, you know, that strong buildup of, of nectar and the carbohydrates that bees need before and after a bloom time with successional plants. So thinking about plants is what I took from that is, you know, you have almost this monoculture of, of almond bloom, but what are the bees going to have, you know, before and after and so much weight is put into bees and the timing of shipping bees and commercial pollination um, is essential for us to have our food sources. So I find that really interesting. Um, I would, you know, I, I mentioned my, my friend Charlie in California, who's in the midst of all of that in the, um, you know, the UC Davis, I think it's, you know, the Fresno Valley where almond pollination is, is everything. So they rely on, you know, rains and what the weather conditions are and drought, which they talked a little bit about in that video. Um, but thinking about the plants and thinking about cover crops, and they talked about vetch. We have so many different, weeds and we think of like loose strife in our area and Canadian thistle and they're horrible plants, but they provide a food source. We're not saying we're going to plant, we certainly don't want to plant Canadian thistle everywhere, but from a, you know, a nectar source, you think of feral colonies of bees and backyard colonies of bees that are managed. Um, the timing of some of these plants is just essential. So the vetch, I think we have a vetch that grows around here, but it's, it almost looks more like a lupine, um, but they use that as a, co a cover crop, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so clovers, you know, clover, there's a number of different types of clover. There's yellow clover, there's white clover. You know, clover has a very high uh, concentration of sugar. I think I've read that like pear trees and certain pears and other fruit trees have a good nectar source sugar content, but they can measure it and study it at like 10 to 15% for pear trees and compared to a, um, a cover crop like clover has like 40 to 50 percent uh, sugar content so the efficiency of bees foraging on um, these readily available clover and wild clover in uh, ditches and along roadsides you know farmers that would be amazing if every farmer were to plant their ditches and their roadsides with habitat vegetation um, a seed mix a simple seed mix would benefit all pollinators greatly. Orchards, you know, when you have a large orchard, apple picking, that's such a good um, food source for honeybees. So I'm not exactly sure which screen you're looking at, but we're just wrapping up. So greatly appreci appreciate uh, sitting through this webinar. And if there's any questions, let us know. But we do have honey for sale. I just dropped off two big boxes of chalet honey if anyone's interested in it. Um, the smaller bottles at Chalet, um, there's been some good support for, you know, bottling and labeling, uh, but Chalet does have Chalet honey on, you know, for sale. And um, that's a, it's a fun part. The honey is a fun part, but it's not my favorite part. You know, the plants and watching the bees is probably my favorite part. But many people ask about honey at Chalet, and this is from our farm um, in Salem, Wisconsin. So there is honey for sale, and I think we can ship it, I believe, if there's enough to be um, 
shift in the mail because we're doing a lot of online purchases lately. So again, thank you. I don't see a whole lot of comments. I think I have a few maybe here, but um, if you could email Chalet or email me directly at adams at chaletnursery.com. Thank you very much.